PETA just celebrated its 40th anniversary gala. We talk about the things that were common prior to 1980, BP, before PETA, and how animal rights changed the world. Next, on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, it was a joyful gala celebrating PETA's 40th. The pandemic forced us online, but there were plenty of stars with celebrities like River Phoenix, Casey Affleck, Iggy Pop, Jackie Chan, George Lopez, Sir Paul McCartney, Edie Falco, and even Kansas City Chiefs star quarterback Patrick Mahomes. And that's just a few of them. Some received awards, like Lily Tomlin. This is a very meaningful award for me to receive. When it comes to helping animals, PETA is one-stop shopping. And some told piercing jokes, like Bill Maher. New rule, listen to PETA. (laughs) According to polls, a majority of people now agree with what PETA's been saying since 1980. Experiments on animals are not only cruel, they don't work. 95% of new medications that work when tested on animals fail in humans. 95%. A drug tested on a mouse has about as much chance of making it to the market as Joe Exotic has of seeing his mullet come back in fashion. (laughs) After the razzle-dazzle, I talked with PETA Senior VP Kathy Guillermo, a 31-year PETA veteran, about all the changes we've seen since PETA took up the fight in 1980. Our conversation on the PETA podcast. So let's talk about that. First of all, the gala, 40 years. I mean, that's quite a celebration. A lot has happened since PETA was founded in 1980. You think back when the first, say, 10-year gala, you thought, wow, that, that's an accomplishment. And then there was a 15 and a 20th. and a, I think there was a 20. Was there a 25th or a 30th? There was, yes. And at every juncture, you thought, wow, look at what what Peter's done. But was there something special or did you feel something special about the 40th? It was in an odd year since we couldn't be in person. So that was the first thing. It was a virtual gala for the people who attended and for the people who didn't just to know that we weren't taking any health risks. So it was quite a different gala. But I, I think also we've reached a certain level of animal rights awareness in this country that we hadn't in the years before, although we've certainly seen steady progress. Yeah. I mean, 40 years is such a significant milestone, but if you go back to 1980, I'm you have to really look at the number, you know, 2020 now, 1980 back then. I mean, forget, forget about the fact that 2020 is in and of itself an historical year you know, with the, with the virus and we can't get together, but just looking back 40 years, what was 1980 like, or forget 1980, what was 1979 like before PETA? I'm so glad you wanted to do this podcast because for anybody who was born in the last 40 years, who may not have been aware what the 1970s and before that were like, I think it's so important. And for for people as old as I am, who were born back then, they just may not have been aware of all that's changed in that time. We have seen an evolution, a revolution, really, in the way that people in this country and around the world see animals, how they understand our relationship to animals, how we talk about them, how we use them, the way they're used or not used for entertainment, for food, what what happens inside a laboratory and what we can do about it has changed. Everything has changed in the way that we deal with animals. And some people who have been born, say, 20 years ago or 25 years ago may accept as normal what we see now. But I can assure you, having been born in the dark ages, that at one time, the concept of animal rights was almost entirely unknown in the United States. And that's within my lifetime. Well, name one thing that's really, uh, that's really just stands out in your mind as, you know, this happened in the 70s. It does not happen now in 2020. 
Ringling Brothers Circus. That's oh. one very key thing. The way that we look at what animals can be used for. Is it ever right to use them to entertain ourselves in that way? Whoever would have thought that something like Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus would go out of business. That's something that's been around for so long and was expected to be around well after our lifetimes. And Peter's role in that, I mean, it was not insignificant, right? It, it was huge. I, I mean, this is one of the things that makes me so proud of the work that we do is that we just don't ever give up. And we know for these animals in the circus, especially for the elephants who were there for such long periods of time, relatively small number of animals compared to, for example, animals consumed for food, and yet their suffering goes on or went on decade after decade. So it was so important to fight on their behalf. And the protests, the PETA employees who followed that circus from town to town and, and worked with local activists to protest at every single venue where they appeared, the lawsuits that we had to bring, the complaints to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the public education. It was a multifaceted strategic campaign, as I think most of our campaigns are. And it took a very long time, but the outcome was so good. That, that's funny because you know, they had the gala, you know, uh, on, on Saturday. I don't think, and, and you know, just the thought that the circus, there's no circus now. And, you know, 40 years ago, there was a circus and now there is no circus. That, that's funny that that's the thing that pops out in your mind. Any other things that, you, you know, you think that, you know, 40 years ago, they, they couldn't oh. conceive that it, something could not happen. And now it doesn't happen at all. How about the fact that PETA has a staff now of 25 scientists and our scientists work with government agencies to replace animals in testing? When I think back to uh, 1981 or 1989, when I started at PETA, we had to chain ourselves to the doors of government agencies and companies that were harming animals and unnecessary tests. Not that any are ever necessary, but in the sense that they weren't doing any good for the human beings that they were supposedly being conducted for. We had to conduct civil disobedience for anybody to pay attention to us. We had to send a man in a giant bunny costume to follow Al Gore on the campaign trail when he was running for president in order to get him to pay attention to the use of animals in these really cruel toxicology poisoning tests that didn't tell us anything about what chemicals do to humans. Those were the kind of tactics we had to use back then. And just about a year ago, there was a PETA scientist sitting next to the EPA director announcing the EPA's plan to phase out all use of mammals in toxicology testing. There are things I couldn't have imagined but hoped for and knew that eventually we would achieve, but to witness them is, is kind of earth shattering for us. So experimentation, that, I mean, it's so different now than it was 40 years ago. Entirely different. And so many of the changes for the better, um, although they're not good enough, were the result of undercover investigations or video released by PETA. I mean, we, we essentially had an entire industry that had no accountability to the public or to Congress 40 years ago. And for those of you who remember, for those of the listeners who remember the Silver Spring Monkeys case, or if you don't, you should Google it because that was the landmark case that just blew wide open what was going on inside so many laboratories. There was no accountability for the way the animals were treated. There was no accountability for the use of public funds in the treatment of those animals. And once we revealed that, it opened a whole new world. But it was many years before we were able to begin shutting down laboratories, before we were able to begin uh, using or encouraging the use of non-animal methods. And at the beginning, if I could just go back to 1989 for a moment, when I was hired, I was hired to work on the cosmetics testing campaign. And that was largely the focus of our experimentation efforts back then. There were perhaps a dozen mail order companies that you could purchase cosmetics from back then. You had to, you know, 
put a check in an envelope and send it off to somebody. There was no online. Remember, we couldn't order these things online. Everything had to be done the old fashioned way. Mm -hmm. And then you hoped your cosmetics would match your skin. <laughs> and, and But you did it because it was so important to communicate to mainstream cosmetics companies that, that force feeding these products to rats and mice and dogs back then was just not acceptable. So we've gone from those 12 companies on the mail order to more than 5,000 cosmetics and personal care products companies on our list of companies that don't test on animals now. It's now a marketing tool for these companies. We're working with the biggest of the mainstream cosmetics and personal care companies. They know what the public wants. So for people who've grown up understanding what cruelty-free meant, there was a time when nobody knew what that meant. And there was a time when I sat across from a CEO of a major um, cosmetics trade group, the uh, father of Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh. His father was the head of the Cosmetics Toiletry and Fragrance Association. And he said, in no uncertain terms to me, you will never win. We will always test cosmetics products on animals. And he really underestimated what the public was willing to stand for. Well, what do you think it was? I mean, PETA pushed, but it really was being exposed to the truth perhaps, or was it the compassion of the people was always there? What, what do you think it was? All of the above. I, I think one thing that PETA did that had not ever been done before was undercover investigations. We showed what was going on inside these factory farms or these huge farmed animal uh, facilities what was going on inside laboratories, inside circuses, inside so many places. And one of them was a cosmetics testing laboratory. And when people saw what was happening with the products that they put on their faces and um, brushed their teeth with and shampooed their hair with, they were horrified. And so it was undercover investigations, public education, many, many, many protests. We, we pioneered the use of stocks in cosmetics companies to bring our issues before shareholders. Um, we hung a banner from the Eiffel Tower. That was one of my very first assignments when I went to work at PETA. We did anything we could to keep this information before the public. And remember, there was no Facebook there, there, was, there were only newspapers and television stations, and there weren't very many of those. And we were so reliant upon the media to get our message out. Our newsletter back then was literally a newsletter. It was a, a paper, <laughs> a paper uh, brochure that we sent to people once a month or once every other month. And that was how we communicated with our supporters. So 40 years now, we're talking about experimentation you talk about cosmetics. You talked also about scientists on PETA staff. There is a difference between the experimentation on animals for things like cosmetics, but there's also this other field, the regulatory field, at where animals were tested to make sure that not just products, but certain processes were safe. And that has undergone a change. In fact, it's probably indirectly impacted how the vaccines have been rushed through. Uh, talk about that and talk about how PETA has maybe indirectly sped up the process for the vaccine makers. Oh, I don't think there's any question about that, but it was a combination of a crisis right now and the need for speed that finally made it happen. Uh, but to go back to Mr. Kavanaugh for a moment and his insistence that things would never change, well, they did change because companies realized they couldn't sustain their current practices of poisoning animals to death uh, and stay in business. And they changed and out of that grew an entire industry of non-animal test methods. And over the years, as we've added scientists and scientific expertise to our staff, we created the PETA International Science Consortium with scientists from around the world. We're now funding the development of non-animal methods. Uh, we, are work we are collaborating with uh, different laboratories to get non-animal methods inside those laboratories. And this has had an impact on our work with the FDA and trying to persuade the FDA that in fact, they, they never really needed animals in the first place because it didn't work very well. So following that progress, the other amazing thing that happened was that scientists began to look at whether or not 
animal experiments and the tests on animals, toxicology tests, were even effective. And what has come out in the last decade is the utter failure, proof of the utter failure of animal experiments to lead to good medications, to new medications, to vaccines, and to cures. And we're looking at a 90% failure rate of animal studies to lead to any treatments for humans and a 95% failure rate on drugs that have been developed and vaccines that have been developed in animals to work in humans. So if you develop a vaccine in a monkey, the chance that it's going to work in a human being is actually very slight. So here comes COVID, a tragedy by any measure, and the need for a vaccine to be developed quickly and to be tested quickly. And both Pfizer BioNTech and Moderna, who have developed the two vaccines that are now being used uh, and about to be approved in the Moderna case, both of them said right up front, COVID acts differently in animals than it does in humans. And so we didn't need to do the tests on animals. And the need for the vaccine to be developed quickly meant that the years and years of trials involving animals were bypassed. And it's opened a new door. And if we pay attention to this and move forward accordingly, we will probably see vaccines be developed and tested in humans much more quickly. So now I I didn't want to say PETA directly has a hand in that. That's why I said indirectly. But if PETA weren't pushing uh, for that, where would we be? We'd still be probably testing on animals needlessly and fruitlessly. We'd be right where we are with vaccines for HIV and malaria and Zika and tuberculosis. There aren't any. There have been lots that have been developed, but do they work in humans? No. And some of them have even been dangerous. So it ended up that it isn't just good ethics, which is what PETA had always argued from the start, but it's good science too. And we're at a a state where that has all come together. And so- that's part of that's one aspect of something today that wasn't around 40 years ago or that a, a sense of that progress uh overall would you say in the experimentation world i mean you wrote the book so uh, about the silver spring monkey case monkey business uh does it still upset you that there are still primate centers in the united states because you know, they, I don't know what they did after the Silver Spring. They were, were there improvements and how were there enough improvements so they can continue these primate centers? Well, th- there were a number of changes that were made after both the Silver Spring monkeys case and after a couple of other high profile, really disturbing uh, cases that we released. We released a video of University of Pennsylvania head wound laboratory where experimenters were cementing, literally cementing helmets onto the heads of baboons, injuring their heads with a hydraulic arm that punched the heads and then using a hammer and a chisel. And I mean, really a hammer and a chisel, that isn't metaphorical, to get the helmets off and then making fun of the brain damaged baboons. They were not very bright because they put it on film. And when we released that film, it, it ended those experiments. Uh, but it also led to, in addition with the Silver Spring Monkeys case, it also led to Congress making some changes. The first animal, the Institutional Animal Care and Oversight Committees, so-called IACUCs, were developed to try to uh, make sure that experiments that were done on animals were actually worthwhile they have been a disappointment. I don't think the experiments are worthwhile, but it was a change. There were some other changes made, some slight changes made for the improvements of housing the monkeys. Uh, But in fact, there are tens of thousands of monkeys who are still used today and held today in laboratories. And there's a lot of work to be done on that front. And tell me, all right. So we have this idea here, 40 years, we've talked about experimentation How about in some of these other areas? How about in terms of the food we eat? I remember being in Washington, D.C., trying to find a a veggie burger, and people would, like, look at me funny, like, what the heck is that? (laughs) And there were no veggie burgers. I don't know what there was. What did we eat? We ate air burgers back then, I guess. That's right. That's 
That's what we called them. We called them Air Burgers from Burger King, believe it or not. And you could actually, it, it was a, a sign of progress at the time that you could go into Burger King and you could order what they called a veggie burger, but which was really a bun with pickles and mustard and ketchup and lettuce on it. And we were thrilled at the time <laughs> that we could eat that, that we could actually go into a fast food restaurant and eat something. Um, I remember many very rubbery sort of hot dogs coming out of cans. There just wasn't an awareness. If you went to a restaurant to order something that was vegetarian or vegan, and vegan was a word not even known back then 40 years ago or even 30 years ago to any extent. Um, if you wanted vegetarian food, you might get a plate of tired, boiled vegetables. And now that whole area has been revolutionized. And some parts of America are just absolute meccas for vegans. But I, I'm very proud of the fact that that PETA really introduced the word vegan into common usage in the United States. The, this in England, of course, it was a word that was in use, as was animal rights. But in the U.S., I remember in 1991 being warned that America wasn't ready for a vegetarian campaign. And we at PETA were saying, well, we're going to get them ready, and then it's going to be veganism. And to see now that the word vegan and the, the, the vegan lifestyle, which of course encompasses more than just food, it's no animal products at all, to see that embraced by so many millions of people, it's amazing. Yeah, you know, even then... Something like vegetarianism, which isn't even as extreme as veganism, not that veganism is extreme, but it was, you know, it was just uh, someone who ate vegetables more than meat. It wasn't, uh, but it wasn't considered uh, uh, as that radical, but people didn't know what to think about vegetarianism. That was considered far out. It really was. The, the people who were vegetarian, uh, who were pretty well known back then were considered kind of cranks or, or uh, Buddhists, you know, <laughs> and, and it was, it was quite unusual. Uh, so it, it seems like if we ran across people who were vegetarian, it was like meeting a long lost friend. And now, I mean, you really can't turn the corner without running into somebody who's, who's vegan or vegan most of the time. And so the options for what we can eat are amazing. And, and, and here in the United States, of course, we have so many amazing options at the grocery store. So uh, not just what we call meat substitutes, but the array of flavors and vegetables and fruits and beans, the things that, that we can cook and eat that, that we didn't know about before, or we hadn't put together before. I mean, we, we had many meals of uh, pasta with beans on the top of it. I'd say that a meal I still love, by the way, but <laughs> It, it is great to be able to go out and know at almost any restaurant you go to, they have a vegan option. And, and it's, it's even growing. People are trying to come up with meat that uh, is not meat, uh, cruelty-free meat. Uh, some with, you know, that uses, you know, meat cells, but some that has, uh, you know, that is totally plant-based. So everyone is like looking for the next thing. I mean, that's, that's an advance that wouldn't have happened, say, 40 years ago. I, I think that's true. And, and it begins with these simple campaigns and educational efforts that we had just to introduce the concept, to talk about, first of all, the animals, the animals who are the individuals with their own lives and their own rights, who are not our possessions, to use and to consume in that way. It begins with that. And, and then it begins with showing people how. And we've always worked so hard to give people the tools that they need, beginning with what we call our vegan starter kit, which is a magazine that gives you great information, still available, one of our most popular items at PETA, and you can get it free. You know, we were one of the first families that were featured in that for a long time. That Did That's you know right. That? With our, our daughter, who's now... 30, uh, yeah. drinking soy milk, which <laughs> when she was about five back then was, was still very unusual. Yeah. All right. So we talk about the changes in food. How about clothing? You know, in the PETA gala, there was Joaquin Phoenix talking about his, be, just being conscious about how suits were made of wool and wool came from animals and how he was not going to wear a wool suit anymore. And I, I thought, yeah, you know, for a long time, even when I was vegetarian, I thought, 
oh, well, a wool suit, that's, that's not that bad. I mean, people were talking about leather shoes. Okay, that's bad, but wool suits, that, that's okay. And then it dawned on me that, no, that's not okay. I mean, there's a new awareness about, about clothing being vegan and cruelty-free, all because of PETA, I guess, huh? We've seen the same kind of revolution in clothing. I mean, if you go back 40 years, the fur campaigns were just beginning. And and there were some other groups working on fur. PETA introduced the celebrities to it. We introduced the concept of I'd rather go naked than wear fur, a campaign we've now retired since there's so little fur out there anymore. It's not really needed. But we didn't stop with fur. The point was to go on and make sure that all these animals exploited for clothing, that what happened to them was exposed. And we have continued to release investigations and continued to work with corporations throughout the decades to get them to stop using animals in these ways. So um, not just fur, but wool, as you mentioned, angora ripped from from rabbits, uh, ostrich skin, alligator skin, crocodile skin, and alpaca all of these these products that are that are not products you know animals are not our closets they they are their own lives and their own world and we don't have the right to do that but these as we introduced these each one was pushing that envelope a little bit farther and a little bit farther and i think people have begun to see now that uh that there are ways that we can live our lives completely vegan, not just in what we eat and the cosmetics we put on our face, but what we wear too. And it's, it, it's been remarkable to see what's come up to replace animals. So we've seen leather, a, count, a kind of a leather made out of pineapples, uh, PETA approved handbags that are faux leather, designers who advertise their coats as faux fur proudly because they know it was it was made without harming any animals. And so clothing, I, I guess people were dressed up. Well, we couldn't see how people were dressed up necessarily at the, at the 40th, but they were dressed. If they, if we were alive, we would have seen people dressed up a lot differently than say at the first gala or 1979 or 1980. You know, it's been, an evolution over the years. I've talked about a revolution, but it's also evolved and people's understanding of these issues have evolved and the options have increased. I, I, I actually remember the first time you were trying desperately to find a good pair of non-leather shoes that you could wear for business. And I had the same issue and you can't wear your, your canvas sneakers to a business meeting. Now, There is no shortage of beautiful shoes, beautiful jackets. You can get motorcycle jacket. You can get non-leather S&M gear if you're into that. There is something for everybody out there, and it's just not necessary anymore. Well, it never was. I have to be careful of that word. it's, It's just there's no excuse anymore for using products that come from animals. In the area of entertainment, we talked at the beginning about how Ringling Brothers is one of those things missing in action or you know, not missing in action, dead, not around. It was around in 1979 before PETA, BP, before PETA, but now 40 years later, not there. It, are there any other examples in entertainment that show that kind of remarkable transformation in entertainment? The international opposition to bullfighting and to captive dolphins and orcas. That's been staggering to see, and that especially in the last decade, and even just the last few years for SeaWorld, to see what happened to SeaWorld, uh, to their attendance, to their profits, after people became aware of what was going on with these individual orcas this is, I think, an area where in some ways we've, we've made just so much tremendous progress. And as always happens, you know, you fight, you fight, you fight, you protest, you strategize, you educate, you do investigations, and then something happens that tips you over that edge and people suddenly realize, oh, wait, you know, and for SeaWorld, it was the documentary Blackfish. For horse racing, it was the deaths in California last year. 
Um, so I, you, you keep laying the, the path down, you lay the, the bricks down along that path toward the end, and then something tips you over the edge. But I believe now that we're at a place where it's simply not acceptable to see animals as our, as our playthings. I mean, if you look at the international opposition to bullfighting, for example, and the, the places around the world that have banned it, the opposition among the population in Spain, which is practically synonymous with bullfighting, it shows such an evolution in thinking. And so as we wrap up, as you look back 40 years, sum it up for us. I mean, a lot of things that many people, the society, the world took for granted before PETA really kicked in in 1980, the things that happened in 19, in the seventies, you just don't see now. Um, and I, I think that it's, it's, it's pretty amazing because you can point to, to PETA and say, if it weren't for PETA, we would be doing a lot of those, a lot of those things that were there in the 70s would still be around. PETA and its supporters. I think that's really true. And, and, and I say that humbly because I don't think any of our work would have been possible without our amazing supporters, the tens of thousands of activists who've gone out to the protests in the pouring rain, you know, and who made sure that somebody was there to say, no, this isn't okay. You know, to the reporters who covered our work, who made it possible for us to be on the front pages and in the headlines, to the celebrities, you know, who, who took a risk. One of the videos that was shown at the, the gala celebration, the virtual gala celebration a few days ago was Katie Lang, who was the one of the first people to come out and say, hey, it's not okay to eat cattle, even though she came from cattle com- country in Canada. And she was banned at various country music stations after that. So all of the people who played a part in this, I think, you know, really it's them. We have a lot of work to do. There are so many billions of animals who need our help. And there's so much more to do. So while we celebrate, we can't be complacent. We've got to get back to work. And the thing that amazes me every day is that I know if we send out an action alert and we ask people, please call this business or this university that's using animals or this government agency that's harming animals in laboratories, call them and tell them what you think about that politely, of course. I know that 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 facility, that business, that university is going to get hundreds of calls in that day. It's going to get tens of thousands of emails, and this really changes the world. So we celebrate and we say we've made huge progress, but there's a lot of work to be done. We've got to stay focused. We've got to know that animals need our help. There's still a lot to end and a lot to begin. And so as we close... What were you feeling when you were watching? We were watching the 40th uh, gala together uh, on uh, the live stream. What were you thinking? I mean, you've only been with Pete has been around 40 years. You've been with it 31. So a good deal of uh, Pete's time. What, what sort of feelings did you have about, about the organization and the work you've done? I love our gala celebrations. We don't have them very often. And when we do, it's one night where we put aside the enormous task uh, of trying to get animals out of horrendous situations. It's one night where we put that aside and we just celebrate what we've been able to accomplish. So I think for that one night, it's allowed. <laughs> and I was extremely happy and, and loved seeing it. I hadn't seen it before the rest of our supporters did. So it was kind of thrilling to see the tremendous changes that have been made and the support that we have among celebrities. And I just I thought it was an amazing event. And then it was back to work. There's a lot to do. to Senior VP Kathy Guillermo talking about all the changes since 1980, 40 years of PETA. See the clip of the 40th anniversary gala on PETA.org. And that's our show this time out. 
Hey, you can contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. Or on amok.com. Or see my work at the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. That's at aldef, A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts, where you can rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.